A Single Shard by Linda Sue Park Chapter 5 On his way to Min's house early one morning, as the plum trees took on their gold and scarlet autumn garb, Tree Ear spied the potter Kong wheeling a cart toward the kiln site. The cart was covered with a cloth. That in itself was of interest to Tree Ear, an ordinary commission for a set of household bowls, say, would not merit such caution. Kong had to be firing something special that day. Moreover, the fact that Kong was on the road so early meant that he wished to reach the kiln before anyone else. He would crawl into the oven tunnel and push his work to the farthest end, yet another precaution against curious eyes. Tree Ear stood still for a moment, arms crossed and brow furrowed. It seemed that it would be a good idea to visit the kiln when this particular load had finished firing. But when he searched the kiln site several days later, Kong's work was nowhere to be found. Over the next few days, as Tree Ear trotted about the village to and from work, or on errands for Min, he kept his eyes wide in search of Kang. His vigilance was rewarded on the fourth day. Tree Ear crouched beside Kang's rubbish heap, a spot he knew well, and watched as Kang emerged from his potting shed early that evening carrying two small bowls. Kong held them carefully, as if they were quite full. Concentrating on the bowls, he stumbled on a stone in his path. The contents of both bowls sloshed over a little, and Kong cursed loudly enough for Tree Ear to hear. Then he disappeared into the house. Tree Ear waited a moment longer before creeping to the spot in the yard where Kong had stumbled. In the fading light, he examined the spillage closely. Clay, mixed with enough water to be semi-liquid. The potters called it slip. Nothing unusual about that. But one thing puzzled Tree Ear. Two bowls two different colors of slip, brick red and white. Tree Ear slipped away from the yard, thinking hard. There were places along the riverbank digging area where the clay was of various colors, to be sure. But what the potter sought was the gray-brown clay that fused so well with the celadon glaze. Both the body of a vessel and its glaze changed color when fired. A vessel that went into the kiln a dull, mousy color emerged a remarkable translucent green. So the diggers avoided the areas where the clay was striped dirty white or rusty red, as clay of these colors did not make the transformation to celadon green when fired. Yet Kong was working with red and white slip. What could he be doing? Trier knew that potters sometimes attempted to paint designs on their work using colored slip. But the attempts were far from successful. When glazed and fired, the slip blurred or ran, making the edges of the design indistinct rather than crisp and clear. Every once in a while, an inexperienced potter would try his hand at painting his pieces, but the more accomplished potters, Min and Kang among them, had long ago given up trying the technique. Trier did not believe that Kang was painting his pieces, but what else could one do with small amounts of colored slip? As he walked home that evening, 
No answer surfaced among the questions that darted about like fish in his mind. The endless cycle of work for men continued. Chopping wood, cutting clay, draining clay. Sometimes there would be a small diversion, like the time men sent him to the beach for seashells. They were used as stilts in the kiln to support a vessel clear of the clay stand on which it was fired, so that the two would not fuse together. The shells had to be of a precise shape and size. Tree Ear returned with a basket full of shells, of which men rejected the majority, then sent him back for more. Tree Ear no longer woke each morning with the thought that perhaps this would be the day that men would allow him to sit at the wheel. Now he thought in moons, or even seasons, perhaps this month, perhaps this winter, or next spring. The flame of hope that burned in him was smaller now, but no less bright or fierce, and he tended it almost daily with visions of the pot he would make. It would be a prunus vase, the most elegant of all the shapes, tall and beautifully proportioned, rising from its base to flare gracefully and then round to the mouth. A prunus vase was designed for one purpose, to display a single branch of flowering plum. Tree Ear loved the symmetry of the prunus vases that grew on Min's wheel. Once, back in the spring during his early days with Min, he had watched the potter place a plum branch in a finished vase to judge the effect. The gentle curves of the vase, its mysterious green color, the sharp angles of the plum twigs, their blackness stark amid the airy white blossoms. The work of a human, the work of nature. Clay from the earth, a branch from the sky. A kind of peace spread through tree ear, body and mind, as if while he looked at the vase and its branch, nothing could ever go wrong in the world. The days shortened and grew cooler. The rice was harvested and the poor were allowed to glean the fields for fallen grain heads. It was an arduous, back-breaking task, hours of work to gather mere handfuls of rice. Tree Ear rose before first light now, spending an hour or so in the fields before going to work. At the end of the day, he returned to the fields again collecting rice even after darkness had rendered his eyes useless. The rice gathered now would see the poor through the winter months when no wild food grew. There were times at the end of the day, especially when Tree Ear thought he could not gather a single head more. I don't really have need of it now, he would think. But alongside that thought, another would rise. Who knows how long men will want me to work? And he would redouble his efforts. Crane Man was busy too. When he grew weary of gathering rice, he would sit at the edge of the field, plating handfuls of rice straw to make mats and sandals. This was a skill he had taught himself long ago, being unable to perform more vigorous work because of his bad leg. Crane Man made Tree Ear sandals first, saying that the boy had more need of them because of his work. He measured Tree Ear's feet carefully and plated several layers of straw for the thick, sturdy soles. More straw was cleverly twisted and woven to form the sides. Finished, Crane Man exclaimed one evening, tucking in the final straw as the last of the winter light faded. He handed the pair of sandals to Tree Ear, who bowed his thanks 
and bent to put them on immediately. Crane Man's face fell. Though Tree Ear jammed his foot forward and stretched the heel, the sandal was too small. Crane Man muttered grumpily to himself and fished around in his waist pouch for the grubby string he had used to measure Tree Ear's feet. He held it up against the sole of the sandal. It was a perfect match. He snorted. Ho! he said. So I did not err in the making. You, my young friend, have been so thoughtless as to grow in the last month. It was true. Trier had noticed himself that very day when he had bumped his head on a section of the bridge under which he had been able to stand erect before. Despite the joke, Trier shook his head ruefully over Crane Man's wasted work and the sandals brought to mind another worry. Every year at around this time, the monks came down from their mountainside temple to collect their tithe of rice. Sometimes they accepted other donations, such as warm clothing, and Tree Ear stayed alert on the chance that a monk would pass on such garments to the poor. In this way, Tree Ear had often garnered a winter wardrobe for himself, and Crane Man. This year, the monks had not appeared. Perhaps there was sickness in the temple or some other untoward event that prevented their coming, but whatever the reason, Tree Ear was growing concerned for his friend. Crane Man always suffered from the cold, and already the nights were frosty. Soon winter rode on the back of the wind as it swept down the mountain slopes toward the village. Snow fell only rarely in Trupo, but Tree Ear could see his very breath now, and the sharp air was full of invisible imps that bit his nose and hands and feet. It was time for Tree Ear and Crane Man to make their annual move. During the winter, the friends sheltered in a dugout on the edge of the village. The farm that once stood there had burned long ago, but the vegetable pit remained. Farmers stored vegetables for their own household use in pits the size of a room. This pit, like the others, had a sloping ramp that allowed entry. Crane Man could stand erect in the pit with his head still below ground level. The two friends roofed the pit with tree boughs and straw. Crane Man's mats lined the floor. Tree Ear hated the cold nights in the pit. Although he knew it was better to sleep out of the wind, being underground made him feel colder. And closed in, too, unlike the bridge, with the river a constant reminder of faraway places. If it weren't for Crane Man's presence, Trier could never have borne the long winter nights. Not long here, Crane Man said every year. The worst of winter, snow melt, spring flood. Two moons, perhaps, and the bridge will welcome us back. Trier waited in the yard. Min had not yet emerged from the house. When the door opened, it was his wife who appeared instead. She was holding something folded in her arms. Trier, she said sharply. He looked up in surprise, wondering what he had done wrong. Then he saw that though her mouth was stern, her eyes were twinkling. How can you work properly for the Honorable Potter if you are shivering with cold? She scolded. She held out something dark and soft, and Tree Ear rose from his bow to take it from her. His eyes widened in wonder. It was a jacket and pantaloons made of heavy cotton, quilted and padded, the warmest of garments. Min's wife took the jacket back and held it up before him. This should be just the right size, she said, 
raising her eyebrows. Realizing what was expected of him, Trier reached for and donned the jacket. A delicious coziness enveloped him. Min's wife must have had the jacket warming by the fire inside. Good, she nodded, seemed to hesitate for a moment, then spoke softly. Our son, Hyunggu, died of fever when he was about your age, she said. These clothes I made for him, but they were never worn. Tree Ear tried to swallow his surprise, but he was sure that it must have shown on his face. Min, a father? It hardly seemed possible. Tree Ear could not envision Min at anything but his work. The idea that he might once have had a son. Wear them in good health. Her soft voice interrupted his thoughts and he was suddenly aware of his discourteous behavior. He bowed again. Deepest gratitude to the Honorable Potter's wife, he said. She nodded again and disappeared into the house. Min came out the next moment. He looked over Trier in his new jacket. Trier held his breath, wondering how Min would feel his son's clothes on a lowly orphan. Her idea, not mine, the potter muttered and waved at Trier to get started on his work. Throughout the day, Trier kept rolling up the sleeves of the jacket, which were a little too long for him, and it made him almost too warm, accustomed as he was to hard work in his sparse burlap tunic. So the idea was born. The jacket should fit Crane Man fairly well. And fit it did. To Crane Man's delight. At first he refused it, saying that it was meant for Tree Ear. But Tree Ear insisted, having thought about it all the way home. Was it wrong to give away a gift that had only just been given him? It was a gift he argued with himself, which meant that it was now his to do with as he pleased, to wear or to give away. He thought of Min's wife and decided it would not displease her if he chose to give the jacket to his friend. Persuading Crane Man was another matter. If you will not wear the jacket, I will not wear the new sandals, Tree Ear said firmly nodding at the unfinished shoe in Crane Man's hand. Ha! Crane Man shook his head. Stubborn monkey! I have been making you sandals every winter since you came here, and now you would refuse them? But even as he spoke, he put on the jacket, and Tree Ear could see the pleased look beneath his scowl. The trousers were too short for Crane Man, so Tree Ear wore those himself. They examined each other, their new garb in sharp contrast to the other rags they wore. Crane Man began to laugh. Apart we look strange enough, but together we are as properly dressed as any man. And he was still laughing as Tree Ear served supper from the gourd bowl. Flickering lamplight caught Tree Ear's eye as he walked back to the pit from Min's one evening, snug in his new trousers. The days were so short now that he always came home in darkness. The light came from the shed behind Kong's house. Tree Ear paused in mid-stride. A light, visible from a shed with no windows, there must be a hole or a crack somewhere. The temptation was too great. Tree Ear stole silently over the frozen ground, edged along the wall of the shed, and after a quick glance around, hunched over to put his eye to a shoulder-level knot hole. With the two bowls of red and white slip before him and an oil lamp just beyond, 
Kang sat in profile to Tree Ear's view, using his wheel as a work table. He was working on a small wine cup. With an incising awl, he inscribed the leather hard clay, a simple chrysanthemum design, far cruder than much of the elaborate incision work for which the potters of Chulpo were known. But rather than outlining the petals in the usual way, Kang was clearing away the clay to leave teardrop-shaped depressions. As Tree Ear continued to watch, Kang took up a dab of the semi-liquid clay on the tip of the awl and deposited it into one of the petal spaces. He repeated this action for each empty space until the white-petaled flower was clearly visible against the dull clay. For the stem and leaves, he used the red clay. Then, with a planing tool, he carefully smoothed away the surface of the design so that the colored clay was completely level with the body of the vase itself. Kong eyed his work critically, then stood and replaced the tools on a shelf. Tree Ear realized with a start that the potter must be finished for the night and would emerge from the shed momentarily. He looked around warily and darted back to the road. Tree Ear's neck and shoulders were cramped from hunching in one position for so long. As he hurried on his way, he shrugged to loosen the stiff muscles, but he might as well have been shrugging over what he had seen. <laughs>